So I am now going to bring on our next guest, uh, Mark Sloboda, who is an international relations expert. And I'm really excited to hear his thoughts on the developments with Julian Assange and the importance of WikiLeaks. So I'm going to bring him on now. Thank you for joining us, Mark. Can you hear me? Oh, and uh, every time we bring on a new panelist in Zoom, by the way, they always have uh, they always are muted by Zoom. So I will un uh, if you have if you can see the bottom left button to unmute, that would be great, awesome. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, we can't see you. Uh, do you have your uh, video on? Yeah. Hold on one second. Huh. Well, as as Mark uh, sorts out his video, I will uh, quickly look through chat, and I'd also like to ask you all to, if you have questions of Mark that you'd like us to ask, please put them in chat and we will be looking through the etherpad where we compile those questions and we will be asking as many as we can possibly get through in the limited time that we have available to us. And thank you everyone in chat who has participated so actively in asking questions, in sharing this information, in retweeting and sharing the stream itself on social media. You are all amazing and thank you so much for your support. We can see you. Great. <laughs> it didn't like my other web camera. I apologize. Yeah. Um, if you uh, tilt the camera up a little bit, we'd be able to see your face better. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining us. I really appreciate you uh, spending the time with us today on the Unity 4J Vigil. Um, I want to remind everyone that you are an international relations expert. You are a geopolitical analyst. Can you share with us um, your insights on the importance of WikiLeaks geopolitically? What is the impact of their work? Uh, you know, what are the ripple effects that people don't hear about uh, that you are aware of that you'd like to share about? Yeah. Um well, uh, first, I'd like to say that I, I do probably have a little bit of a different perspective than a lot of your panelists that I've heard today. Um, I come from a background in the U.S. military. I served in the U.S. Navy in the nuclear engineering field for six years. Um, so that, that gives me a, a, a security perspective, uh, kind of a, an about face on that, at least, uh, that uh, might put me a little bit different. Um, after that, I uh, actually served, I organized for the Democratic Party, much to my chagrin these days. And uh, there were times when uh, I organized for the Democratic Party, registering voters uh, uh, here in Moscow uh, for uh, John Kerry, um, met with uh, uh, Ambassador Vershko, and you know, even worked out of the U.S. Embassy at times. Uh, so so my, my about face on that is, is uh, uh, fairly significant. I think it also gives me some insights uh, into um, exactly how the power systems um, that a lot of what Julian's and WikiLeaks work challenge uh, how they operate and, and how pernicious they are. Um, and the first thing that I, I would like to say is, is it's, it's, often assume that WikiLeaks, that, that Julian Assange operate completely on the principles of um, a kind of uh, utopian idea of the absolute free flow of information um, and um, kind of a, a techno utopia approach. Uh, uh, seeming to, to counter what, what he rightly sees as a, as a techno-dystopian approach. However, I think that's kind of a simplistic reading of um, Mr. Assange. And I would invite everyone to, you know, 
not just partake of WikiLeaks of, of, of the information, uh, you know, via uh, leaks and other sources that it provides, but also to read uh, what Julian Assange and, and WikiLeaks uh, has written. Uh, read read uh, his latest book, Verso Books, the WikiLeaks Files. It's an anatomy of how the U.S. empire works using uh, the diplomatic cables that were secured by WikiLeaks. Read his uh, 2012 Cypherpunks, um, which is uh, an example of, uh, it's an examination of, of the way the world is is moving, how technology, how this, uh, the internet, this free flow of information that once promised to be the most emancipating force in the world, at least in the eyes of uh, many of its, its, its advocates, um, actually became a, a system of, of what could be called totalitarian or inverted totalitarian uh, oppression uh, that, that threatens an extremely dystopian future. Um, Julian Assange has written uh, uh, there. He's he's written a number of blogs and essays on on um, the state uh, and terrorism. I, I would recommend everyone to read these. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And that, it's, thank you for bringing that up because I think a lot of our viewers and listeners may not have you ever heard of these these uh, texts that Julian Assange has authored, which are so important and provide unique insight in addition to the work that WikiLeaks does. So thank you very much for bringing that up. Yeah, he's, he's not only, uh, you know, a, a, an important journalist, uh, you know, that's one aspect of his work, an important social activist. He's a, an important political thinker. Uh, and, and, you know, he hasn't uh, a constructed, you know, uh, new architecture, but he has stood on top of the, the backs of, of, of other giants, as everyone else has, and, and, and has progressed forward our understanding. And he deals a lot with the examination of power, which, which I think draws a lot off of uh, uh, Stephen Luke's power, a radical view. Um, but he uh, applies specifically a lot of emergent network theory. Um, and he is examining how states, and particularly Western states that are at the forefront of this, I would call it an unholy conflation of of government, media, the security state, and the new tech giant driven surveillance state. Um, and he, he imagines uh, them uh, as these authoritarian regimes as authoritarian conspiracies. And his, his definition of conspiracy is not a prosaic one. It's actually drawing on, um, again, on, on, on emergent network theory. He, asks us to imagine um, these uh, repressive Western conspiracy states as uh, wooden planks. And these wooden planks have nails that are agents uh, of, of the conspiracy, as you will, although again, not in the prosaic sense, and that um, they're connected by twine, thick twine, thin twine, and this twine represents the flow of information. And it is the flow of information, uh, secure information, between the networks of, of the conspiracy, as, as it were, at least among the, you know, the network, um, that gives it value. Um, and he, he posits that it's really impossible to uh, break up this network by normal means. You, you take out a nail, you take out a board, a plank, uh, you, know, you, you break a single uh, network a string of a flow of information, it's just replaced. It doesn't inhibit uh, the uh, the total system of repression, and and he spends a lot of time thinking about why it is repressive and why this um, secure bargaining of information across power structures is pernicious, specifically because it is kept from the public and it, it forms a type of groupthink among the elites that form it. Um, and he he envisions WikiLeaks as a way to change the rules of the game. And rather, you know, they concentrate on, on combating this structurally. He um, wants to have this flow, free flow of information, make the information in this secure networks, you know, imagine it as government institutions, the media, 
the uh, industrial security complex, Google, Facebook, et cetera, uh, their information, if it lacks meaning, simply because it's made, been made available to everyone, or even if they can't do that completely, uh, at least to have enough leaks, uh, leaks of this information that they begin to doubt the other nodes in this network and don't want to exchange information freely. They become paranoid. And the more repressive the system is, the more scared uh, individual nodes are of sharing information and the whole thing breaks down. And uh, this is all in relation to, you know, the power system in the world as it exists today. And, and, and you know, we have to be perfectly uh, um, honest about that. And it's often referred to as U.S. empire or, or U.S. led empire. I, I think empire is, is, a, is a dated term. I don't, I don't think it properly, uh, uh, you know, defines things. And I think it's lost all of its cachet after the Cold War. What, uh, what would you define, uh, if you were going to replace the term empire, what would you define the U.S. Yeah, the, the, uh, system as? Yeah, yeah. Um, if you say empire, you say imperialism, you're immediately laughed off by a lot of people. Oh, this is a Cold War dinosaur. He's repeating tired old tropes. So um, I, I think hegemony is, is the term. Uh, you, know, you want to talk about uh, U.S. hegemony or U.S.-led hegemony. It, it covers all facets of power, um, military, financial, uh, the, the um, entertainment security complex with Hollywood, the infiltration of the media by the, the, the security states, um, the revolving door between the media, the security complex, um, the government, and so on. It, it, it's all facets of power all over the world. Um, my, myself, I, I think hegemony is a strong term. I, I, I'd like to think of it more as suzerainty because it's not quite a full hegemony yet. And it aspires to hegemonic status, right? A, a suzerainty. But that, that is a, a technicality and hegemon is the word that seems to have caught on. And you want to take a look at Robert Cox there, um, uh, critical international relations theorist and others. And, and a lot of people have written about it. Even the proponents, the, you know, the, the actors of U.S. hegemony. You know, when they're speaking at an academic level, well, they admit it. They they think they imagine themselves as a beneficent hegemon. And you want to think, how does this hegemony represent it? And as, as a U.S. military vet, I can tell you one of the the most obvious ways that it is. Um, there's over a thousand foreign U.S. military bases around the world. The, the U.S. government on its military alone, just on, on what we, the, the, the transparent part of the defense budget, and there's a lot that isn't, is more than the next 10 other countries combined. And when you consider that a great deal of those other 10 countries are also it, its allies, veritably client states, right? And this is such an egregious overspending. It's, it's called full spectrum dominance. Even when the, the Obama regime left office, they were bombing nine countries around the world. They had U.S. special forces in 160 some countries, and there's only 192 countries in the world. There were actually U.S. special forces in more countries than the U.S. government had embassies in. That's an incredible point. Absolutely amazing. Uh, and you know, and we've seen that. I, I think that this hegemony is is not fully. Not, not in any ways beneficent. Uh, it forces a neoliberal globalization um, and um, a homogenization of, of Western and, and it, I, dare I say, the words American culture uh, quite forcibly, right? You know, it, it, it's kind of a carrot and stick approach around the world. If you willingly accept it and exchanging commodities and reify it, well, then that's all well and good. If you don't, you know, then we'll bring in the tanks and, and, and the bombs and, 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 you know, the regime change specialists. Um, you know, in recent decades, since the collapse uh, of the Soviet Union and, and the end of the bipolar world structure, that to some degree kept it in check, although it, it did propitiate conflicts all of its own, that bipolar structure, the U.S. has enjoyed this unipolar moment uh, of hegemony where it has been unchallenged across the world stage. And we've seen Iraq, we've seen two wars in Iraq, two wars in Iraq 
you know, whether they were talking Kuwaiti incubators, uh, babies, or weapons of mass destruction that, that the U.S. and the world were led into on a number of, of, of false pretexts. Um, we have seen, uh, you know, the longest U.S. Uh, conflict in history, the Afghanistan war, which is going into its 17th year, um, and, and the country is, is, is even more of a mess than it was uh, when the U.S. first, uh, you know, invaded, and, you know, supposedly going after terrorists, which obviously require you to occupy a whole country in, in, in the middle of, of Eurasia. Um, we've seen it in Libya, where, where you know, U.N. resolutions on, on um, humanitarian pretexts and, and, and false cries of genocide uh, you know, this, uh, this uh, uh, social shock where anything becomes possible were, were, were used for regime change. And, and this Libyan state has completely collapsed. The, the country is in the hands of warlords, terrorists, rival governments, and, and a country that had the highest human development, in, uh, human development index in Africa and, and, and the greatest amount of women rights in, in, in the uh, Islamic world, but, you know, it, it is... It, it, you can't even really call it a state anymore. It, it is the clearest example, uh, you know, other than perhaps Afghanistan, of a failed state. Now, there was no ISIS there, <laughs> or, or in many other countries in the world, um, until uh, you know the U.S. created these power vacuums with their interference and, and regime changes. Now, that's not to say that the U.S. directly uh, created ISIS or anything like that, but they knew perfectly well. Uh, you know, and we've seen that through defense intelligence agency leaks, that they knew what the probable consequences of their military and covert actions were, and they thought they could manage the result. It's always about managing the chaos that they create. Um, you know, we, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, Serbia carved up and, and, and a, 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 a also nearly failed state protector of, of Kosovo created. We, we've seen chaos uh, in Ukraine. Um, uh, Somalia, Ethiopia, and, and Iraq uh, twice, three times now, and, and we're looking at Iran, uh, you know, uh, which is, is probably uh, next up to bat right after Syria, you know, the complete destabilization of that country. And Julian Assange has, has recognized all this. He sees the, the how uncontrolled power uh, you know, uh, amplifies itself and, and corrupts itself, and you know, ultimate power corrupts ultimately. Um, and a lot of WikiLeaks work is therefore focused on the United States and other Western, you know, states that are its, you know, client states, willing states, and so on. And WikiLeaks has published uh, reports and leaks from other countries, from Russia, from China, and other countries, um, but the majority of it. And it, it, it's a fair, whether you want to call it a critique or, or, or an admiration like I do, it has spoken on the U.S. And it's because of this imbalance of power around the world and the abuse of it. And when WikiLeaks is exposing, uh, you know, much of this work, um, you know, if you take a look at the uh, Manning uh, uh, leaks, these were real war crimes. I mean, these were war crimes that we all knew happened, right? We people who talked about them were dismissed as conspiracy theorists, you know, as as as, as the usual with coincidence theory, and um, what WikiLeaks, uh, you know, Manning uh, through WikiLeaks provided, uh, you know, to the world is is verification, uh, not only of those incidences but of, of patterns of behavior, and the State Department cables, even when they re you know reveal rather normal daily business operations reveal the arrogance of empire. And behind this is the ideology. It's, it is a supremacist ideology of American exceptionalism. The idea that the, the U.S. is morally, politically superior to all other states and cultures on the face of the earth. And that when it breaks the rules and it does not view itself bound by international law, by the UN Charter, and so on, um, th that it acts in the best interests of the world and the peoples of the world, often over the heads of their own governments. Even if they don't know it at the time, these yellow-skinned and brown-skinned people just need to be liberated to the, the, the truths 
that an American copycat or, or, or at least American controlled society can bring them. Um, this is As why I think that Julian Assange has focused a lot of the work on WikiLeaks on combating specifically these power structures in the U.S., uh, you know, and its its allies and client states. You know, I I, I think how much various states in, in Europe actually have sovereignty. Maybe they're just beginning to rediscover it, some aspects of it again uh, under Trump as, as, as they did briefly under the Bush administration. Um, or you've got states like Saudi Arabia and Israel, firm U.S. allies for control of the Middle East. Often they seem to be, the, you know, the tail wagging the dog as often as the other way around. But um, the truth is neither of those two states would exist in the dominant position in the form that they do today without the United States. And as with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the biggest obstacle to that conflict is not the Palestinians, it's not Hamas, it's not even Israel per se, it's the United States, because the United States is the facilitator for all of this. And a lot of people in the United States don't want to hear this. And, and when leak after leak from WikiLeaks, the majority of them focus on the United States. Oh, Julian Assange hates Americans. No, Julian Assange does not hate Americans. He, in fact, sympathizes with us or he, he, he you know, at sometimes pities. He, he hopes for the best. Um, and, you know, that we can overthrow these these power structures, this regime, um, you know, this this government, uh, you know, that that barely changes. It's certainly not in terms of foreign and intelligence and security policy from government to government to government. And these days, it's not just the United States. Um, and a, a lot of what WikiLeaks is really, I think, homing in on is the five eyes spying cabal. This is the uh, supranational intelligence organization that, that uh, emerged as, as an artifact of the Cold War. It is an intelligence alliance, if you will, between the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, all the Anglophile countries. And there are, are various other iterations. There's nine eyes, there's 14 eyes, but the five eyes are you know, the principal sharers of intelligence. It's not only that these countries cooperate and share information on foreign intelligence. We've seen far too much documented evidence, much of it provided by WikiLeaks, by Snowden and others, that these countries, these intelligence organizations of these countries that all operate above the laws in their own countries actually spy on each other's citizens for each other and share the information among them. And when we're talking Echelon and Prism and X key score, there is no amount, uh, you know, telephone, there's nothing that they do not have access. I don't know, except maybe carrier pigeons. Maybe, maybe they can't quite surveil carrier pigeon communications yet. Although they probably know where and when the pigeons are flying and landing and, and, and so on. And, you know, we, we live in this panopticon and the, Jailers of the Panopticon, who are as much, you know, it's, it's prisoners as they are the jailers, they imagine they're doing a good thing, you know, for us, for the world, and, and, and so on. They imagine themselves as the gatekeepers of, of information and the, these, uh, you know, beneficent overlords of the world. But not everyone agrees with that. A Absolutely. Agree with that. Most countries in the world don't agree with that. And the majority of the population of the world agree that. And a lot of citizens of subjects, in some cases, of these countries that are, are parts of, of, of these uh, hegemony, if what is actually happening was adequately explained to them in terms that they can understand, which the media's one of their main goals is obfuscating what is actually going on, they wouldn't agree to it either. Even if it's, it's into their Shall, say, shall we say short-term material consumer benefits, which is a rather short-term and narrow view even that. 
So I would like to bring you back to your discussion of uh, Chelsea Manning's contribution to this whole, um, you know, revelation of the real history of all of this development and and uh, get your perspective on the WikiLeaks publication of Collateral Murder, that uh, the incredible video documenting war crimes and the other uh, publications that you've mentioned or the Af Af Afghan war logs, et cetera, et cetera. Can you please tell us what the impact is on you as a as a veteran in in witnessing WikiLeaks publish this type of documentation of war crimes, sure. I I think more than anything, it's it, it has been uh, the verification, the the convincing all of us that you know what we had already gleaned from the odd uh, um, uh, journalistic report from from be it from the mainstream media or or you know the work of of media activists, you know, laboring on, under harsh conditions and trying to get through the veil. Um, a lot of it is confirmation of what we knew, you know, it convincing us we're not alone, we're not insane, these things really are happening. Um, and, you know, the, the complete debacle that the Iraq war turned in, not, not just for, of course, you know, the destruction of Iraq, the, you know, the uh, rise of ISIS, you know, the, the problems that continue to beset the region, um, you know, uh, but, you know, for uh, U.S. geopolitically, it was a disaster. Um, the, the power vacuum that was that was created by the fall of Saddam Hussein invited in Iranian influence because these these people who work in the State Department and the CIA, they have a uh, a really blinkered view of human nature, uh, a, a really horrible assumptions uh, uh, based on their, you know, often you know, extreme liberal ideology that um, anyone in the world when freed and, you know, and fed a little bit of, the, of their own propaganda would, would make the same choice as they would. And it simply, of course, didn't prove true in any of these countries that we've talked about. I, Iraq is one example of that. And, and correcting myself, I meant to say the Iraq war logs, not the Afghan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I misspoke. Sorry about that. I, uh, but I, I already got it. Um, you give a country where the primary forms of political identity are still based on ethnicity and religion, democracy, and a majority Shia country is going to elect a majority Shia government that is going to find more common cause with Iran than with the United States that's supposedly liberated. I mean, the, the hubris involved with not foreseeing that, that you know, the, the blinkered ideological probe um, and, and, you know, everything in Syria and so on has been about trying to manage or correct that mistake. Well, if Iran got increased influence in Iraq and now we're worried about a Shia crescent from Baghdad or from uh, Tehran to the Atlantic, well, then we can knock off uh, another uh, country uh, mm -hmm. in the chain, and, and, and there comes Syria, there comes unrest in Libya, and so on. And they, they keep destroying country after country and creating more chaos, destabilizing the region more, generating terrorism. You know, people can talk about whether it's intentional or not. I, I honestly don't think that, you know, except maybe in a few cynics at the, you know, at the CIA and so on, they don't. They don't actively go in. They go in thinking, you know, ideologically blinkered that they can manage it, that they can correct the mistakes that the last group, the last regime change uh, made. And, and it's, it's not just these individual incidences. It's, it's not just the, the, the videos of uh, U.S. soldiers gunning down Iraqis on the road uh, using night scope that, that Manning's revelations gave us. Um, these are individual war crimes, and they, they should have been treated by since. And the fact that they haven't been treated by since, not even seriously by the media, much less by the people that you know should be holding these people accountable, whether it's under domestic law or or international law. Um, but even the media, which has refused to, to make the call by, by political parties that, that have refused to address the thing. When Barack Obama got elected and refused to investigate uh, uh, torture and, and hold anyone accountable. And, 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 um, and, you know, Gina Haspel, bloody Gina, then becomes the director of the CIA, you know, after 
punching pregnant women in the stomach in CIA black sites in Thailand. Well, that's not happening now, of course, right? It, it just happened before. We need to move on. Um, and that makes them perhaps even more, it, it's not just complicit because it normalizes behavior like this. But at least with Manning's revelations, um, I, like I said, I can't say that this was new information to me. I, I already knew what was going on. I think a lot of people did, but it's, it's verification, it's confirmation. Maybe some people who didn't quite believe were convinced by this information, but it is a condemnation and it's a, it's a sign of how deep the control through these power systems, through the media and so on goes, that they didn't lead to more, that they didn't lead to war crimes trials uh, and so on. And, and maybe that's a disappointment. Um, I don't think that Julian Assange and WikiLeaks and, and, and Private Manning are, are solely being persecuted for what they have done. Because let's face it, what they've done is limited. They're being persecuted for what they could yet do. They're being persecuted for the deterrence value to prevent more whistleblowers from coming forward. Uh, you know, Private Manning didn't bring down the U.S. military, you know, the, the generals, the, the CIA, and so on over Iraq. But the, the fact that they got away with it, that could have led to more the centers, uh, more information being revealed from within. That's what they can't allow. But they're playing a game of whack-a-mole. And that brings me to my next question, which is how do you see the impact of WikiLeaks moving forward? What do you see in the future of its impact in the whole geopolitical uh, tapestry as we look to the future? One of the things it's, it, it has done is it's helped political movements, maybe they started off as marginal, so a lot of them, they still are marginal, political movements and some of the U.S.'s allies um, galvanize themselves, draw membership, find inspiration. Um, I, we've seen the entire center political establishment in Italy just fall apart. And this is really scaring people in NATO and the EU. They try to dismiss it as populism, as irrational people being misled by fake news and so on. They, they can try to deny the agency of, of the people involved however they want. But it is backlash for their own internally hegemonic policies in you know, the technocratic neoliberal dystopia that the European Union uh, has become. In France, it nearly happened. The, 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 the major right and left, center right and center left triangulated parties, they collapsed and they had to buttress up a neoliberal uh, globalist bankster under a new branding uh, in, in order to steal the election away. But his approval ratings have fallen right, right, right back down. And we haven't seen the, the last of this challenge to, to centrist power in France because it hasn't even rejuvenated itself and, and, and you know, the next election cycle is, is coming up fast on an unpopular uh, um, president, uh, you know, little Napoleon in France. Um, and, and the Brexit vote shocked us all. Mea culpa. I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I, I saw the remain, the, the scare campaign on, on economic reasons, you know, being presented over identity and sovereignty. Um, so, how much can we say that WikiLeaks has directly contributed? It's, it's like trying to judge, quantify the results of marketing. So we can't. But we can, I think, make a good posit that it certainly is one factor among many. And maybe it inspires other people to, to take up this, this uh, you know, cause, be it from, from the, the, um, the sane alt-right, from the coherent far left, when you've got triangulated uh, center-right and center-left parties in all of these Western countries that just begin to resemble each, you know, each other um, with the same technocratic neoliberal policies, where else can you go but the margins, right? The people with the most extreme views to the right or to the left, and it is a result of a globalized, you know, triangulated uh, world. And the only correct response to that is 
to reach around to the other side and say those people that on this false political axis X, Y, that were presented, which should define how we think about politics, that I actually maybe have more in common these days with the person way on the circle over there. Um, and exactly. that might be the only, the only way to even hope of challenging and dislodge that, that technocratic hegemonic center. I think it's really important that you emphasize the fact that it's a technocracy. And I wonder if you had any comment on the, fa on the rise of the technocracy at the same time that we've seen WikiLeaks, uh, you know, uh, publish its, its releases and grow as an organization that is so incredibly important in being one of the only bastions against the secrecy that goes on with the technocracy. Can you describe that to the audience? Like, what is the technocracy? Um, maybe how WikiLeaks has, has uh, you know, faced off against it in any way and any other comments about it that you have yeah. for our I mean, viewers? It's not a coincidence. WikiLeaks exists because of the technocracy. Right? It, it is a, a backlash of, of this, um, you know, this idea that these political elites, uh, you know, continue to, to um, surveil the populations and control the populations and, and manipulate the populations. Uh, we just had Richard Stengel, he's a, a former um, State Department uh, number four. He uh, he uh, then was editor of Time magazine, and, and now he's giving lectures for the Council on Foreign Relations. And, and just in the last week, he he, he did a, a Council of Foreign Relations, uh, you know, a, a little discussion meeting, where where he joked about being referred to as as the propagandist of the State Department. And he said, "Yeah, we do propaganda." And you know, he, and he rightly said that all states do propaganda. But then he said that he doesn't mind that states do propaganda against their own citizens. And to really hear this from, from the horse's mouth, uh, to, to, to really hear this, I mean, we all know that some of our governments think this way, you know, or justify their actions this way. But, but to hear, that, you know, the sure pathos of, 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 of him treating it so casually and so openly should be scary uh, to, to everyone. And, and um, you know, it show he's a perfect example of this revolving door, this conflation, State Department propaganda to editor of Time magazine, one of the biggest news weeklies in, in America and, and, and the world, to then, you know, the pet think tanks that are funded by the governments that are supposedly uh, at an intellectual level telling us how to think and form the policy that revolves back to the you know, the, the governments uh, in question. And, and, and this is how, you know, the, the, the technocracy works. And, and exposing this kinds of things is, is, you know, part of what WikiLeaks is, is, is all about. And, you know, part of why, you know, how Julian Assange envisions it. Of course, the fact that they can openly joke about it, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe that's not such a, a, a positive uh, sign. You know, we, in, in the EU, we like to talk, they like to talk about it as, as technocracy, as democracy deficit and so on. In the U.S., we, we talk about it often as deep state, these, these, uh, a, a, these unelected uh, bureaucrats in the intelligence uh, fields, you know, the military and, and, and the other uh, executive branches. The U.S. has more executive branches and security apparatus than you can shake a stick at um, that, um, you know, aren't held accountable by elections, as if that uh, changes anything when you're locked into a choice of Coke or Pepsi. And, uh, anyway, with this triangulated center, but they really control the power. And, and you know, for once, we, we've seen a, 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 a political figure in the U.S. That, 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 however, incompetently challenges some of that. Absolutely. And Sorry. yeah, and so... Uh, from your perspective, and I, I'm, I'm asking pretty much every panelist this question because I really want our audience to hear from as many of you as possible on how you feel the audience can participate in protecting WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. I know that y this may not be your forte, but I, I still want to hear your perspective yeah, oh, yeah, on yeah, that. No, 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 of course. And you'll, you'll forgive me if I'm a bit of a pessimist or, or, or a cynic. Not a problem. Yeah, I, I once, uh, I, I heard a, a, a quote that someone said that hope is the carrot dangled before the mule to keep it plodding along. 
And the, the questioner asked, you know, this wise man, are you saying we shouldn't hope? And he said, no, I'm saying that we should remove the carrot and walk forward and meet our fate of our own volition. Even someone who's completely pessimistic and cynical as I is, in no way inhibits my idea that we should fight, that, that we should resist. In fact, I think it makes it even more of a imperative of, of morality and principle. Um, there are a lot of, of, shall we say, US client states, um, looking particularly at Australia, New Zealand, we just saw in Italy, where there, the, the, you know, the, this centrist regimes in power, they are fragile and they are showing signs of breaking. So to be involved politically at, 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 at one level, um, uh, in, unfortunately it does need to be party politics, I think, but alternative parties, parties outside the center and encourage politicians and political movements that are more supportive of WikiLeaks. And, and, you know, I, I don't want to, Julian Assange is important and, and what he's done um, but WikiLeaks would continue even if he was removed or suicide or imprisoned. But individual people have charisma and power, and it would be a blow if Julian Assange fell into the hands of the U.S. and went the route of, of, of some secret grand jury trial, some secret trial under secret laws you know, that, that we couldn't question. Um, you know, do contact your representatives. Uh, it, it can't hurt. And you know, an email doesn't do it. Go to their office, um, get in their faces. Um, but I, I think that Julian Assange saw the the difficulty of working within you know these these already systems. Um, civil disobedience, and anything less than civil disobedience, you know, normal protests and and um, you know. Um, signatures on, on, on you know, various lists that float around the internet, it, that doesn't cut it. Civil disobedience, they will at least notice. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I think, that, you know, the second person, I, th I believe Russ Cameron was of a similar opinion. He felt that it was time for civil disobedience. So it's, it's uh, interesting to hear that echo, definitely. For, for other people like me who, who, you know, did at one time serve in the military, right, uh, or security services or any sources of principal information, fulfill you know julian assange's whistleblowing right and if you don't have that position of power maybe you know someone who does and it doesn't hurt to, to at least explain to them what options you know are what the, the situation is because that you know will remove that wooden plank and nail and and um you know twine uh, that that is these these authoritarian conspiracies that that Julian Assange envisions it as, and hacking, <laughs> which you're not, uh, you know, I don't have those skills, but I know some of the people out there listening uh, do, and um, Julian him, him, Assange was himself starting off as, as a hacker and hacking the the Pentagon and the NSA, or you know, or at least being involved with other people who were. Um, even hacking can be used as a good tool <laughs> uh, when it's uh, against uh, corrupt hegemonic power systems. Absolutely. So uh, I'm going to look through chat for one moment to see if we have any questions from our viewers for you, because I always uh, really look forward to having our viewers collaborate with us in asking our panelists questions. So um, one of the questions that we got from Twitter was, um, if Corbyn wins in the UK, what impact will that have on Julian, if any? Um, I don't know if you uh, focus enough on, uh, or focus on specific, the political situations in specific countries, but I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that question. Well, I know Jeremy Corbyn, I've, I've met him before. Oh yeah, no, I, I understand. <laughs> I, I did my, uh, my postgrad at the London School of Economics and I did some, um, I did some uh, little bit of internship and volunteering for Galloway and Caroline Lucas, and I met Jeremy Corbyn at Marxist Festival and so on. So um, well, he is he really scares the British power structure. I and mean, they, they have really pulled out all the nine yards. You know, they, they've pulled out every trick and trade to try to diminish him, uh, you know, whether that's internally 
by the, you know, the Labour Party, the new Labour elite, or whether it's uh, the BBC trying to Photoshop images of him in, in front of the Kremlin in sinister and red and black coloring and try to make his hat look more like a Russian fur shapu shanka. I mean, it, it, it's really kind of pathetic um, how scared of Jeremy Corbyn they are. Uh, history tells us that they have ways of removing or at least neutering political figures that challenge the political establishment. But I would love to see Jeremy Corbyn get the chance, <laughs> uh, you know, to 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 really shake things up in the United Kingdom. Um, if if Jeremy Corbyn was actually elected Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and survived that process, I would not be at all surprised if, it, within his first week of office, that Julian Assange was allowed to walk right out of the Ecuadorian embassy as, as a free man. Uh, so in, 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 in that case, if you're in the United Kingdom, there is one example of this uh, alternative uh, you know, political voices. Jeremy Corbyn has risen from the back benches to dominate the Labour Party. And as long of it, a lot of it is not because people from all the far left, scattered, fractious uh, leftist political parties in the United Kingdom have flocked back to labor with Jeremy Corbyn and are preventing it, the Labour Party, at least internally, uh, from dislodging in the new labor elite. Uh, so I, uh, Jeremy Corbyn is perhaps one of the, the most hopeful figures out there in the world today. I mean, he should, he, he should not only inspire us, um, but uh, we should do everything possible to empower him at least give him the chance to 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 be and i as much as i admit that i i hoped that obama would at least be better than bush and that some real change might come to u.s foreign and, and security policy I, you know i i knew i would be out protesting him the next day you know and you know i i i that proved my complete divorce from u.s uh, partisan politics you know at least the establishment parties of power but Jeremy Corbyn, I think he's an entirely different creature. Um, and they, from, from the Telegraph, you know, from the BBC to the, to the military, to, uh, you know, the new labor elite, uh, to, they are terrified of Jeremy Corbyn. And that gives me just that little bit of, of, of carrot hope. Absolutely. I think it's really, um, you know, telling that you can really see how effective someone is with, uh, by the volume of the media smears against them. We see that with Jeremy Corbyn. We see it with Julian Assange and WikiLeaks very clearly that their effectiveness um, is terrifying to the establishment and that the establishment media reflects that kind of panic. But speaking of the media, I was wondering um, what your thoughts were on the impact on press freedoms, uh, you know, independent media, but also legacy press uh, freedom. Uh, if Julian Assange continues to be silenced or if WikiLeaks is prosecuted uh, as a news organization, as a publisher of, of information, as a press outlet, what impact yeah. will that have? I, I think one of the things that WikiLeaks has really done over you know, the course uh, of, of you know, its work is expose how conflated the mainstream media is with established structures of power. You know, we, we, we saw the New York Times, the Guardian, Le Mans first try to co-op when Julian Assange, you know, from the best of intentions, tried to work with them and through them. And then all one by one, they turned on him. And where uh, WikiLeaks had cooperated with them in other places, we saw the few voices in that government that were not willing to give sources uh, to U.S. intelligence services, you know, I'm looking particularly at the U.S. here, start to be persecuted. And as media organizations, as you know, corporations, because that's what they are as a whole, they went with this. They didn't fight it. They didn't scream. A lot of it was happening under Barack Obama, and, and they were all too willing to quietly buck down and, and, and play. We all Remember what happened with the Guardian when with uh, British uh, intelligence forces physically breaking apart the computers. And we can clearly see 
how the Guardian's writing has changed as a result of that. It's editing, it's writing, it's headlines. Um, so if anything, I, I, I unfortunately think that, that WikiLeaks has done a lot to, shall we say, stress test the media, uh, and they failed. And it has exposed how conflated they really are uh, you know, as a, as a real fourth estate with the other branches of, 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 of um, corrupt power. But this has read simultaneously to the rise of the alternative media. And, uh, you know, the, try to find someone in the alternative media, you know, be that from the left or the right, that has not been inspired or does not quote WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, you know, in any of the countries across the world. And you can't find it. Absolutely. I mean, just uh, with uh, disobedient media's work in independent journalism, I am always just astounded at the breadth and depth, the um, the amazing expanse of variety of stories that WikiLeaks documents impact and would not be able to be published without those documents um, backing them up. So, I from what I from what you're saying, it's it's almost as if the legacy press media will not be that um, that much affected because they are so in the pocket of the establishment already um, as WikiLeaks goes forward, if I'm understanding you correctly. And, but you're saying that the independent media though, the, the truly anti-establishment media could not function without WikiLeaks moving forward. Absolutely. Burn the establishment media to the ground and let's see what we can grow from the ashes. Fantastic. I lo- that's a great, a great thought. Um, so do you have, we have about 10 minutes left in our segment. If you have any thoughts that you'd like to um, really emphasize with the audience, any topics that we didn't cover, or um, just final thoughts on the importance of WikiLeaks to you personally. All right. Um, I really... I think the, the heart of, of WikiLeaks gets back to this, this question of, of hegemony and, and why it's challenged. Um, and I've seen a number of, of U.S. articles in, in the mainstream media, you know, attacking Julian Assange because of his, his focus on, on America and, you know, particularly its military and, and, and covert uh, things uh, around the world. Um, and he, he does that because of the power imbalance in the world. If we had a future world suddenly emerge where China, as, 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 as some writers like to fantasize about, became the, the, the counter-America and became the hegemon who was interfering in countries around the world and elections around the world and so on, as the United States has done, I think Julian Assange and WikiLeaks would be out there doing everything they could, uh, you know, with the exposure of information, the publication of, of WikiLeaks to challenge China or, or any other possible future hegemon that y- you might be able to imagine. That's not the case right now. And that's why uh, their work uh, has focused on, on the United States and, and it's, you know, it's military, it's its um, uh, government power structures. Um, and I think that is, is, is admirable. I think that's the most admirable thing about WikiLeaks. I, I'm a realist and a, and a cynic. I, I, I've been through the institutions of this power. I've been through its, its political parties. Um, and talk of, of human rights and um, press freedoms is all well in well, all well and good. I'm, I'm just not a, a, a utopian. Um, I, I don't believe very much in human nature. Um, but we have seen these same arguments weaponized by countries like the United States. When, when it, of all countries, is, is crying human rights and, 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 and press freedoms and using that as its pretext for expanding its hegemony and, and challenging, uh, you know, um, the the real international order. You know, the U.S. likes to a lot, and its allies like to talk about the liberal international order. 
And what they're doing by mentioning the liberal international order or the international community is they are avoiding talking about the actual existing world order that was created in the wake of World War II of the United Nations, the UN Security Council, the UN Charter, its bedrock principles of sovereignty and non-interference in the domestic affairs of others. And aggression is the capital crime under existing real international law. But far too often we've seen this hypocritical use of human rights and press freedoms and, 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 and you know, democracy, quote unquote, used to, um, as a pretext, as a justification, you know, along with this ideology of American exceptionalism, to cause really untold death, destruction, destabilization throughout the world. And when we talk about a hegemon, it's not just military power, it's not just financial and economic power, it's cultural power, but it's also the use of, of this astroturfed civil society. Right? They like to call a lot of these organizations NGOs, non-governmental organizations. That is when these organizations are state-funded and um, often run by people uh, who were you know, at positions of, of power uh, within these state structures. Hi, Ken Roth <laughs> uh, at Human Rights Watch. I'm talking about you. These aren't NGOs. These are gongos. These are government-organized, non-governmental organizations. And this... this um, corruption of the idea of civil society, of international civil society, is no less a factor of this hegemonic control than everyone else. And I would simply don't let that completely dampen your, your, your spirit of international solidarity and, and, and your you know, beliefs in the better angels of human nature, but at least treat what you hear with a grain of salt. Absolutely. And I think it's really important. Not only have we invited, you know, uh, participants, panelists from multiple ends of the, the political spectrum, but also to have cynics along with uh, the more uh, idealistic guests, because we want and we encourage that range of ideas on yeah. this vigil. It's supposed I, to be. I yeah. A, a quick question for you on that, that vein, because you, you might know a little bit better than me. What have Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International done for Julian Assange? They, I, to my knowledge, they have not advocated for Julian Assange at this time. And actually, I'm really glad you brought that up because just a few days ago, WikiLeaks, uh, Assange's legal team uh, broadcast a link from justiceforassange.com uh, imploring the public to send a letter to these NGOs, to all of the NGOs they can think of, to call on them to represent Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. And it's definitely a really, uh, it's an indictment of, 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 the, of the West that the Absolutely. NGOs uh, that are supposed to be Definitely. advocating for human rights have not advocated for a I, political I prisoner. I tag them on Twitter on these things all the time. Of course, you never get an answer. You probably get muted or blocked or, you know, or, or what have you. But that is exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about when I, I say that hegemony has even corrupted civil society. And, and to just be careful when you hear words like press freedoms and human rights tossed around by those who are some of the biggest hypocrites and abusers of them around the world. Absolutely. And thank you so much for joining us and sharing this time with us. I know that everyone who's participating has a very busy schedule. Thank you so much for your insight on the ge geopolitical impact that WikiLeaks has had. I really, Thanks I know that I've. It's an honor and a pleasure and free Julian Assange.